constant listeners, Far Middle Podcast, Nick Dealey is with you. Thanks for tuning in. Episode 64, we're not going to dedicate this episode to a single person or even a single team. Instead, we're going to dedicate episode 64 to the NCAA men's basketball team tournament bracket. It's a geometric thing of beauty. Uh, The nickname everyone knows, even if they don't follow basketball, right? March Madness. And by the way, that phrase, March Madness, is trademarked by the NCAA, so you got to use it with caution. And they've also trademarked not just March Madness, but Elite Eight, Final Four, and Big Dance. Uh, The NCAA is always looking out for the student athlete and the bottom line. Nonprofit, you know my what. And I know it is now technically 68 teams with those playing games that they've added in. But the essence, you know, it's still a 64 team bracket when it's all said and done. And the 64 team field first was instituted and introduced back in 1985. The coveted number one seed down to the lowly 16 seed, looking to be a Cinderella across four regional brackets. Again, a a geometric thing of beauty. And I think the men's basketball tournament teaches kids more about small schools and geography uh, than end up being 16 or 15 seeds than any college prep course can. It's amazing how many uh, young adults or kids or or students following the bracket, filling out their brackets. Where's that school at? What state? You know, what's, uh, what's going on with that institution? They learn a lot just by filling out the brackets. I guess it's a silver lining. Um, North Carolina, has the most number one seeds at 17 uh, since the 64 uh, team field was instituted. NCAA gets about $800 million a year from the tournament's TV rights. That's going to jump to over a billion a year in 2025. The men's basketball tournament, when it's all said and done, it's effectively 100 plus percent of the NCAA's profitability. So it is big business. The greatest championship team since 1985 when the field went to 64 teams, well, that could you know, end up in endless debate. I'm going to go with the 1992 Duke team. Uh, you had Leitner and Hurley on there as seniors. You had a guy named Grant Hill uh, up and coming. He turned out to be quite the player, both in college and in the pros. Second best all-time team, I would go with the 1990 UNLV running Rebels. I love Tarkanian. Revolutionary team uh, with their style of play. Really enjoyed watching that team in the early 90s. And by the way, that 1990 UNLV run and Rebs team, that brings to mind the best team to not win a championship, which, again, for my money, was the 1991 UNLV team, which is even more stacked, um, but did not uh, end up winning a championship that year. Cinderella's, when you start thinking about like these Cinderella wins and who ended and runs and who ultimately ended up winning the overall championship, my favorite Cinderella, I wouldn't say, wouldn't say it's the biggest Cinderella, but my favorite Cinderella was easy for me. That's the North Carolina State team, Coach Jim Valvano, 1983. I watched that as a, as a kid from start to end of the tournament. They were a six seed when they started, and uh, the ACC back in the day, that was my second favorite conference to watch. And my second favorite Cinderella story, that one's an easy pick as well, That was the 1985 Villanova Wildcats, uh, Raleigh Massimino. They were an eight seed, so they were even more of a Cinderella, uh, so to speak, at least to make it all the way through as national champs than than NC State was in 83. And the Big East, for me, that was the ultimate basketball conference in the 80s and 90s. And just think of the coaches that you had in the Big East. You had Raleigh Massimino and Lou Carnesecca, John Thompson, of course, at Georgetown, Rick Pitino, Jim Boeheim, Jim Calhoun. Um, Some of them I loved. Some of them I despised, but all of them, all of them I respected. And how could you not based on what they all achieved? Now, does the tournament, you know, today hold the same sway over me? Uh, No, uh, not even close. And, you know, maybe it's one and done mentality uh, that you see throughout college basketball these days. So you really can't get to know the players and the the team's identity um, really doesn't shape over the course of a couple of years instead of sort of a one shot deal. So maybe that one and done is a big part of it. Or maybe it's all this conference realignment that never seems to stop and it's not stopping again. Uh, I see with uh, USC and UCLA joining uh, my Big Ten with Penn State. That'll be interesting to watch. And maybe it's because of other things in life just drawing your time away, right? You grow up, you become an adult, and all kinds of other things, more important things are tugging at your time. So I do watch the tournament. Don't get me wrong. It's not like I don't tune in, but not nearly as intensely or as closely as I, as I used to. So episode 64 of the Far Middle goes to the Field of 64 and March Madness. Thanks for some of the best sports memories ever. So let's get things moving on 64 and start connecting dots. Now, 
the NCAA men's basketball tournament bracket went to 64 teams in the uh, the mid 80s, right? So we haven't seen, interestingly, inflation as high as it is now since sort of just before uh, that period of time, a couple years prior in the early 80s, which leads me to the first topic to discuss. I had a, an interesting conversation with a colleague who is in the construction industry. Uh, he runs a very large outfit that undertakes very large projects. And he was talking about inflation and how it's impacting the business in just basic and in very fundamental ways. He brought to light issues and consequences that went beyond the typical commodity type inflation or supply chain challenges. And that conversation and what his feedback was, his insights, it really opened my eyes to how these bedrock industries like construction and are dealing with out of control inflation, which as Milton Friedman taught us long ago, is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. It's still the case in 2022. And then, of course, it gets stoked even further. Inflation does by excessive government regulation that creates scarcity of supply. So I want to share with you how these big industries like construction are managing inflation, which I fear is going to lead to more inflation. It sort of begets more inflation. So to understand, first and foremost, large construction projects when they are bid, they're not going to be you know, started into well into the future, and they're not going to be completed for years after that into the future. There is a big and long time horizon for these projects. So the bidder firm, the firm that's bidding when preparing the bid, they're going to need to have somewhat of a crystal ball when projecting costs and time delays and availability of needed supplies and services. And in summer of 2022, all of that equates to major construction firms juicing up their bids because they assume inflation and scarcity are going to continue to dominate in the coming months and the next few years. And to not assume that is basically ending up playing with fire, and it takes only one bad bid or an underwater project to bring a company down, not just for the fiscal year, uh, but potentially permanently. So you really can't afford to take chances or risks of getting that wrong if you're one of these large construction firms. And these types of firms are going to have to manage risk well, or they don't make it in the long haul. It just takes that one big misstep, as I said. So you'd rather miss out on a bid in an inflationary environment, forego some potential profit instead of winning a bid that ends up you know, way underwater, which means ultimately you lose sort of the ultimate winner's curse. And there are all types of contributors to why construction firms have to raise their bid prices. You've got um, things like liquidated damages clauses, which are prevalent in many major construction contracts. So that's a big contributor. So, of course, are material costs and supply chain bottlenecks that create more cost and or delays. And of course, you've got this issue with workforce because construction in the end remains a highly labor intensive and specialized skill set type of an endeavor. So when it's all said and done, a construction firm worth its salt will do one of two things in a bid with this type of economic reality that it's facing. It'll build contingency into the price or it's gonna walk away from the work opportunity. And firms are doing both of those things in mass in a big way these days. That makes the inflationary situation self-fueling and self-fulfilling, so not just self-fueling, but also self-fulfilling. And the expectation of inflation tomorrow or the reality of some inflation today, uh, those expectations, they're gonna make it more certain inflation stays longer, that it grows higher, and that it worsens it becomes largely self-fulfilling because current expectations on the future, that's going to determine the actual future. So call it sentiment or astuteness, but the bottom line is inflation is not going anywhere anytime soon, and it might actually get worse before it gets better. And if you're looking to build something big soon, expect higher costs and longer lead times. That would be my recommendations to you. Yeah, so you know the, the theory or fantasy of monetary policy hitting colliding with the real world leading to things like inflation sort of brings us to our next issue to discuss and dot to connect. That's that same dynamic. You know, what happens when policy fantasy meets real world reality? It's playing out in, of all places, in the automotive sector. And the market in automotives experienced all this demand for cars, both new and used, both electric vehicle and internal combustion engine powered the past couple of years. And then government policy came down from above. So what did we see from government? Well, first we had the pandemic shutdowns, which started supply chain bottlenecks. Then we had stimulus payments that were justified on the government mandated shutdowns from pandemic, which stoked inflation. And then we had all these energy policy subsidies that created an asset bubble for things like electric vehicles. 
You then had Fed free money and zero rate policies that we just discussed. They really fired up and stoked inflation, and they drove up the prices for cars, both new and used. Then you had inflation, right, coupled with energy policies that were designed to create energy scarcity that led to individuals like Vladimir Putin feeling emboldened enough to invade places like the Ukraine, which then drove up commodity prices even further. The current administration, it continues to drive energy scarcity by attacking and vilifying domestic energy every chance it gets, and that drives up prices more. And now we have the Fed that's hiking interest rates because even PhD economists from the Ivy League, they cannot deny the raging out-of-control inferno that is inflation these days, transitory or not, call it whatever you want. You add all this up, and you get what we have in the auto sector these days. You've got global players like GM who say they can't ship or they'll miss shipments and sales targets, largely because of those pesky supply chain bottlenecks for things like semiconductor microchips and for batteries. Then you have drivers who can't afford to drive anymore because our government and other Western governments have purposely created that scarcity and price inflation that you see at the pump. It was not domestic energy companies that did that. It wasn't even Putin that did that. He is a symptom, not the root cause. And it's not the middle class that did that. No, President Biden, you did indeed do that. And then consumers, they can't afford to buy the cars new or used because interest rates on loans are going way up, making the monthly auto loan payments unaffordable, and the credit scores get hit at the same time when other loan payments on credit cards and mortgages go up, making it tougher for a consumer to obtain a car loan. And let me, while we're at it, let me fill you in on a little secret. That is that public companies, like some of these automakers, when they're missing a target for Wall Street, they will look to first name the most abstract root cause they can think of. So first it'll be supply chain in some faraway land. But as the problem persists, and I believe this problem of lagging sales and shipments will persist, the truer and more meaningful root causes will come out to see the light of day. So be on the lookout, watch the next few months in the automaker space to see what I'm talking about. I think you'll see this very sort of dynamic unfold. Now, what is going on with cars is what happens when the bureaucratic fantasy and the government spreadsheet and the environmentalist dream, when they all come to fruition in the real world. You get chaos and efficiency and pain. And the sooner we stop adhering to the left's economic playbook of socialism and to the vaunted energy transition that ain't what it was promised to be, and the radical environmentalist movement and its assault on individual choice, the better we'll all be, including the GMs of the world. Now, speaking of big government and politicians, I still continue to be amazed at how quickly and drastically candidates and politicians, they change core positions on the biggest of issues when the political winds or opportunities change course. And no one, certainly not in the media, in the case of those candidates on the left, even mentions a word about it. Just to illustrate how prevalent this is with the biggest of political names and the largest of issues, consider two people who recently ran for their party's nomination to run for president and the never more important issue of school choice. So two big name politicians, two big, uh, the ultimate position, so to speak, within the country to run for. And I think one of the biggest issues of all uh, when it comes to things that, that impact uh, society and culture, which of course is school choice. So first we have Elizabeth Warren, the senator up there in Massachusetts, um, she was a huge advocate for school choice. Not many people these days remember that or want to remember that. She wrote a book with her daughter where she advocated for a fully funded, that was the term she used, and a well-designed voucher program, another term that she used, that would, quote, relieve parents from the terrible choice of leaving their kids in lousy schools or bankrupting themselves to escape those schools, end quote. So this was the senator, believe it or not, around 2003 in print. But then she decided to run for president which means if you're a Democrat these days, you better bow to the public unions, including the teachers union, right? And you better bow to the left. And those entities, those groups, they despise school choice because that's competition, that's looming accountability, that's individual choice. So suddenly, the senator from Massachusetts does a complete 180, and no one seems to mention a word or calls her out on it. And then there's the other example of Cory Booker, applying the same 180-degree directional change on the same issue. Senator Booker, before he was a senator from the Garden State, was the mayor of Newark, New Jersey. And during that time, he was a hardcore supporter of school choice. And he took money from foundations and nonprofits who were pro-school choice advocates. 
He gave a keynote speech in 2016, which wasn't all that long ago, to the American Federation for Children, which is a national school choice advocacy group. And he said in that speech that, quote, the mission of this organization is aligned with the mission of our nation, end quote. Pretty powerful stuff. Then he decided to become a senator and then seek the Democratic nomination to run for president. And once again, like Senator Warren, he figured out quickly these days that as a Democrat, that meant paying homage to the public unions, particularly the teachers union and to the left. And he has seen an opponent and has been seen as an opponent of school choice ever since. But again, no one in the mainstream media seems to remember the statements from 2016. How strange is that? And this leads to a related topic to connect, which is school choice and public education. Those two things, they've got two massive components tied to them. The first is, of course, the educational quality and how well the kids can be taught versus how they actually are taught. That's the whole issue that we just discussed with respect to school choice or lack thereof. But the second big issue is the massive cost of an unaccountable public education system. Now, these two issues, of course, they're interrelated, one impacting the other and vice versa. Let's spend a minute touching upon the math of what it costs to put a kid through K through 12 in the U.S. these days. That math is going to astound you, I think, and then it's going to infuriate you when you compare the cost of a K through 12 public education to the results with respect to how proficient our kids exit the overall process after all those years. So first, understand costs are rising out of control when it comes to K through 12 public education. Since 1970, K through 12 spendings tripled in inflation adjusted dollars, 750 plus billion dollars today, every year. An average student or child will have $250,000 spent on them from K through 12, from kindergarten to high school diploma. That's government money, which means it's taxpayers money. Boston and New York City, as examples, they spend over $25,000 per kid per year on public education. Philadelphia, in my home state of Pennsylvania, it's around $24,000 per student per year. Now, you compare that cost to the results or what the taxpayers and the parents and the students get for all that money spent. Barely a third, a third of fourth graders in urban cities in the United States can read or do math at grade level. In Philly, uh, the city that I just cited as an example, 17% of eighth graders are proficient in reading, just 17%. And I could go on, and you constant listeners know that we've cited these types of bothersome facts time and time again on the far middle. And I also dedicate a large portion, portion of my book, Precipice, uh, to this topic. The data are extensive, but the data never cease to amaze and to infuriate me. What an outrage as to what we're doing, or not doing, I should say, when it comes to our kids. Now, what gets interesting is what educational or school choice might do, particularly in urban America. So if we spend around $250,000 per student from K through 12 in the United States, and in our largest urban centers, that spend swells to around $25,000 per student per year, compare that to private education. Tuition at the average Philadelphia Catholic school, high school, is about $8,000 per year. And for private school in Philadelphia, it's around $12,000 per year. If we handed over what we already spent on public education to parents, Parents would send kids to private schools, particularly in urban districts, have money left over, and see their kids' competency and proficiency levels easily double in math and science and reading. For fourth graders, eighth graders, and high school grads, for all of them. Take the money left over, which would be about half of what we spend today in the public K-12 through system, and either reduce taxes for all taxpayers, reduce the federal deficit uh, to pay down all that government debt, which is currently at 30 plus trillion dollars, I might add or have the parent bank it into something like a 529 plan for the kids post high school education, apprenticeship, or job training program. Everybody wins. The taxpayers win, the kids win, parents win, and great teachers win who will be in demand to go to work at the best educational centers. But there are a few very powerful losers in this type of an outcome or scenario where school choice starts to prevail, and that is government and the public unions. And unfortunately, they hold all the cards because we dealt the cards to them willingly. Maybe it's time to deal out a few new hands because the stakes are quite high in this game of chance called life for the next generation. Something to think about. In this issue, educational choice, it really often comes down to where individual states and cities are going to fall out. You know, which ones are the most desirable uh, to go toward, migrate towards, live in, etc. Which ones got, are the worst? Which ones experience the worst quality of life for their citizens? 
And that leads to the next topic to discuss, and that is how credit ratings firms are now applying subjective ideological filters to assign credit ratings to states and to their debt, and to local government debt as well, by the way. And the biggest of the top three credit rating firms in the land began a few months ago, back in March of this year, to start assigning ESG ratings to state and local government debt. Now recall, ESG stands for Environmental Social Governance, and we've had extensive conversations on ESG in prior episodes of The Far Middle. We've written on this as well. Uh, we talked about how there's a good side to this when done right. There's a bad component to it if not done right. And there's an ugly side to it if you allow the bad to accumulate over time. One of the bad components, you'll recall, is how ESG can be applied quite subjectively to favor an ideology or a leaning or a political view without any quantitative or legitimate reasoning behind the screening or the credit rating. Well, what is the largest rating firm in the land doing now with ESG uh, when it comes to state and local government debt? It's exactly what I just said. It's becoming very subjective to favor certain ideologies or leanings or views without sticking to the quantitative and a legitimate rational or reasoning portion of ratings and how you assess credit worthiness. And they're doing that for, as I said, state and local government debt. Now, this credit rating firm is magically and less than transparently assessing states based on how these states do a couple of things. What types of things? Well, first, how the state is managing carbon, whatever that means, because it's not clear what managing carbon actually specifically warrants, which is the problem, of course, to begin with when you get to things like these subjective ESG filters. Also assessing states on how they are managing political unrest that's stemming from community and social issues. Now, one can only imagine what that can lead to. Think about how a Republican or a Democrat would interpret that one. What is unrest? And what would social issues or community issues, what would it lead to? But you don't seem to need to worry about the Democrat or Republican interpretations because this ratings firm clearly leans I won't say blue, but maybe leans more appropriately left. And adverse publicity is another sort of filter that they want to apply. Adverse publicity that leads to what? To reputational risk. Again, what a conservative or a liberal would point to uh, when it comes to different things are going to be quite different. So a Republican who's a conservative would point to New York and Cuomo or Chicago and crime. A Democrat who is liberal would point to Florida in the Disney fiasco. But again, this credit rating firm is not the most balanced ideologically or politically. So I can tell you it's a safe bet that an entity like Florida has more to worry about on this one than, say, California. And it's yet another example of how the capital markets continue to orbit closer to the political and the ideological and further away from the quantitative and the objective. This credit ratings firm is looking through this new murky black box of ESG score to reward the favored states, to penalize the unfavored. They'll determine subjectively who's favored and unfavored. And it turns the objective process of scoring credit and debt into one where the credit rating firm looks to be able to place its thumb on the scales when weighing credit ratings. Why listen to them or rely on them when such obvious malfeasance is occurring? The thought that credit rating firms who are warranted as objective and apolitical might be anything but, bleeds into a related item to talk about. That is how the elite, they could be in academia, they might be in government, but specifically economists, they were horribly wrong on the most basic of economic items. And here I'm talking about things like GDP and inflation and supply-demand balance. So Dr. Janet Yellen, she recently admitted that she might have been wrong on inflation earlier this year. Yeah, I think she might have been. But even when she offered her mea culpa, it was a half-hearted one because she referenced inflation being caused by what she tagged as unanticipated shocks to the economy. Now, that's code for things like Ukraine and Putin. So I'm sorry, but the shocks that brought inflation, they were anticipated and they frankly were desired by those running D.C. these days. So what were they? Well, they were creating energy scarcity um, through energy policies. They were creating labor low participation rates by government policy and by transfer payments. Um, they were about breaking the supply chain through excessive regulation. They were stoking inflation by gross government spending and by budget deficits. And they were inflating asset bubbles with the never-ending quantitative easing and the free money that negative real interest rates bring to bear. And Dr. Yellen of Yale, 
she was not alone when it came to being asleep at the wheel on the most pressing of issues at the worst of times. The now exposed, and in hindsight, the insane Build Back Better program, if you recall, it had a $5 trillion price tag, and its proponents brazenly promised that it would solve inflation, it would make inflation better. In September of 2021, um, when Build Back Better was being lobbied to the public, there was an open letter that was signed by no less than 17 Nobel Prize winners. 17. Now, where did these Nobel Prize winners hail from? They came from Georgetown. Princeton, MIT, Stanford, Columbia, Yale, Harvard, and so on. And President Biden waved that letter around everywhere he went, bragging about how approved his Build Back Better program to be just what we needed at the perfect time. Now, I'm going to read you the excerpt of the letter and just listen to to what it it warranted and, and posited. The American economy appears set for a robust recovery in part due to active government interventions over the past year and a half, including President Biden's American Rescue Plan. But reversing years of disinvestment in public goods and addressing the country's long-term needs, including building towards sustainable, inclusive growth and facilitating our clean energy transition, will require more. Success in the 21st century will require building upon the bipartisan infrastructure deal that's passed the Senate, which prioritizes investments in our nation's hard infrastructure. The president's Build Back Better agenda employs a broader conception of infrastructure by making critical investments in human capital, the care economy, R&D, public education, and more, which will reduce families' costs. While we have all had different views on the particulars of various economic policies, we believe that the key components of this broader agenda are critical, including tax reforms that make our tax system more equitable and that enable our system to raise the additional funds required to facilitate necessary public investments and achieve our collective goals. Because this agenda invests in long-term economic capacity and will enhance the ability of more Americans to participate productively in the economy, it will ease long-term inflationary pressures. Oh my God. Now inflation rages, and thank God we did not go the Build Back Better route, primarily because of the guts of someone like Senator Joe Manchin. But do these elites apologize for their mistake? Nope. They say their predictions about the benefits of the Build Back Better program, they're never given the chance to be proven out because the Build Back Better program never happened. And elites wonder why normal Americans lost all confidence in them. Well, in the words of Robert Plant of Led Zeppelin fame, let's bring it on home for episode 64, which I hope you enjoyed. With all this stress around Russia and the EU and the U.S. and geopolitics, it brings to mind a famous retort in history between our special but at times strained relationship with Western Europe. It was the early 1960s. JFK was president and his secretary of state was Dean Rusk. So Secretary of State Rusk was in France, and Charles de Gaulle, the French leader, decided to pull out of NATO. And de Gaulle said that he wanted the U.S. military out of France as soon as possible. So how did our Secretary of State reply? He said, does that include those who are buried here? Well said, Secretary of State Rusk, well said. That's it for now, but be back in a week.